Welcome to the second day of the OTEC Symposium. Um, we still have some people streaming in, but I, uh, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, keep it brief while we, uh, while we try to recuperate some of the time. Um, thank you again for being here. Uh, yesterday we kicked off the OTEC Symposium. We had uh, close to 100 people in Delft from over 14 countries. We expect, uh, again, some new people coming in as we're, uh, we're doing the, the OTEC Symposium in collaboration with the Offshore Energy Conference and Exhibition. So there's a, there's a, uh, a different mix from what we saw yesterday at the, in Delft. Um, I'll start with a brief summary of the day yesterday. We started off by handing over of the baton. So last year's OTEC Symposium was held in Malaysia. Um, Paul Dennison, the, the chairman of the OTEC Foundation, uh, received the proceedings from last year's symposium and kicked off the, the, the day yesterday. Uh, we had a nice opening by Tim van der Hagen, he's the president of the TU Delft, um, that uh, highlighted the need for, um, for OTEC technology, um, the involvement of the Dutch offshore sector uh, academy uh, companies and, and NGOs like the OTEC Foundation to make sure that the technology moves forward and is implemented. Um, it was an inspiring uh, room. Um, we, it was held at the Science Center for those of you that couldn't be there. Um, the day was, uh, was uh, the master of ceremonies was Cornelis Block. He is um, co-founder of ECOFIST, uh, sustainability think tank uh, in the Netherlands. He's also the chairman of the Ocean Energy Platform. Um, he started off with a keynote um, where he highlighted the possibilities for reaching a renewable energy future by 2050, 100% renewable energy future by 2050. Um, he has run the numbers. It's possible. OTEC is a necessary element of this, uh, of this future. And um, that, was, that was nicely highlighted yesterday that despite the low, in, the low oil prices that we are still expected to continue, um, that despite the current situation in the world, uh, the development of, uh, of ocean energy technologies is still, uh, still very much relevant and uh, current. One of the, let's say, underlying <coughs> themes that we saw yesterday was that OTEC is really a collaborative effort. We have people from all over the world working on this technology. We're all working together. Uh, this is a nice example of how we're all um, working together, trying to find out the answers to all those questions that we all have in the development of the, of the technology. Yesterday's event was a bit more technology focused. Today we're going to be uh, talking a bit more on, on the market, on, on really how are we, um, how are we going to get this technology uh, that we saw yesterday uh, is, is basically ready for commercialization. Um, out to, to full-scale implementation around the world. Um, the collaboration started yesterday, so this is a nice picture of a signing ceremony that was held between the Dutch delegation and the Japanese delegation, um, where an MOU was signed to start uh, and kick off uh, a stronger collaboration between the, between the two countries on the technology. Um, David and Toto on, uh, on behalf of Blu-ray signed the agreement, Cornelius Block on behalf of the TU Delft, and, and the Dutch delegation, um, together with Professor Ikegami from, from Japan. Um, yesterday we also saw, uh, we heard from a lot of the different companies and institutes working on the technology, working on all the specific uh, projects around the world. We saw that there's quite a number of projects under development. Um, it was highlighted to see, I think, from, from from my perspective, um, the work that's being done by Korea, a very aggressive timeline, which in only a couple of years since they decided to start an OTEC program, they've already started off their pilot, moved forward, now they're developing a one megawatt plant in, in Kiribati. Um, they are really involving the community there to, to make sure that the, that the project is, uh, is implemented successfully, not just by dropping a technology, but uh, developing it from within. Uh, also heard very nice uh, information from DCNS and Aqua on the development of their 16 megawatt plant in Martinique, um, which is on schedule. Um, 
thanks to the European Union also for funding it. Uh, we also heard from all the, the other projects that are going on, uh, our project in Curacao, in the Dutch Caribbean. Um, we heard also from, from some of the, the other initiatives around the world, um, also Kumejima, what's going on there with their, with their grid-connected OTEC plant, um, and some of the other projects. So there's a, there's a nice summary of, um, of the projects that were there. Nice visual uh, representation of the group photo that we had. Um, this again in an inspiring setting at the Science Center in Delft. Um, it was a great kickoff, and I hope that today we'll also be able to to move forward into some of the other challenges that we all see on the technology and uh, what are the opportunities really that um, that that this um, industry that's forming uh, can have for the world. Before we start, I want to also acknowledge. Um, Unfortunately, last week, uh, Wednesday last week, uh, Dr. Robert, Robert Cohen, uh, at 92 uh, years old, passed away. Dr. Robert Cohen was one of the pioneers on the OTEC industry. He used to work for the Department of Energy in the US. NREL uh, was instrumental in the first OTEC experiments. Uh, some of you that are in the room may have known him. We had the pleasure of communicating with him a lot. He actually, uh, even at his 80-something at his, uh, years of age, was uh, the creator of the OTEC Facebook page, uh, which uh, later became integrated into the OTEC Foundation uh, um, Facebook page. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the people that have done a lot of work for, for the technology. So to kick off the day, um, we have a very um, interesting keynote speaker today. Um, I would like to first uh, welcome to the stage Fabian Cousteau. Uh, he is an aquanaut, an ocean explorer. Um, of course, some of you may recognize his last name, Cousteau. Uh, he is a third generation ocean explorer and he has very, very close ties to uh, the OTEC technology, to OTEC industry. He'll, uh, he'll elaborate a uh, a little bit on that, on, on how his family through the generations has been involved in the development of the technology, basically from, from, from its beginnings, starting from the French uh, Jules Verne that we heard yesterday had that, that idea. He's of course also French. So please uh, put your hands together for Fabien Cousteau. until it doesn't work. There we go. Hey, Will, I saw it work earlier. Are you working on the previous three techniques? Uh huh? Are you working on the downstairs monitor? No. I see exactly what you see, which is a very mysterious place. <laughs> <laughs> Although sometimes when you go to the deep ocean, that's about what you see. <laughs> Well, we saw this slide yesterday also <laughs> from, from the intermittency on uh, coming in from other removal. Sometimes you get a blackout. Maybe that's what's going on here. Uh, that, that reminds me of a story uh, while we're, we're yeah, waiting. Is, uh, I was testing a few years ago, many years ago actually, a uh, submarine, uh, one of them called Jules and the other one called Jean. There are two submarines that we worked on. And one of them, Unfortunately, the one that I was in uh, at about 2,000 meters decided to ha exhibit every possible problem you can think of. The communications to the surface went out, the sonar went out, the uh, air conditioning went out. So I don't know if you've ever been in a submarine or submersible, but when the air conditioning goes out, it gets to be quite tropical in there, even at 2,000 meters. Um, and eventually there was a short and all the lights went out. And so that black screen reminded me of exactly what it looked like when all those things went out. 
That is definitely not my keynote. Anyway, so it's a pleasure to be amongst all of you today. I, uh, I'm a little bit of a fish out of water in this group, I guess, because uh, in a sense, uh, I don't belong to the industry. I don't have a business in OTEC, uh, per se. Um, it's, uh, it's something of a, of, a, of a very deep interest for me and for now three generations for several reasons. Um, I see that my slide is still not up. We're not going to have beautiful photos. That's OK. You'll just have to be entertained by me. <laughs> uh, it's, it's something that uh, sings to my heart for a number of reasons. Uh, since a very young age, I've been polluted by uh, previous generations that were maybe uh, pioneers in, in several ways. One of them being conscious of the fact that uh, you know, we're here on this planet. It's a very closed loop system with the exception maybe of solar energy and, and a few other things. And if you look at our planet from outer space, it is the only one that's within our proximity, not a lifeless rock floating in the empty void. Why? Quite simply because of the blue. And this blue veneer is the catalyst, is the life support system, is the oasis in space that provides for everything that we know, everything that we love, everything that we depend on. And this blue veneer, so to speak, is by and large the ocean. But more importantly, liquid, the water, this little thing that we take for granted every day, most of us anyway, is our life support system. Now it takes very, a lot of different forms. Um, obviously in the OTEC industry, you, you understand water uh, from, from that perspective and maybe even much further if you are a diver, or if you are uh, uh, maybe an ocean advocate. But if we think about things, it's really about a rhetoric, right? So it's about a different perspective. In the ocean world, it's about 3.4 billion cubic kilometers of volume. It's un, almost unfathomable, you know, part of my expression. Uh, it is uh, an enormous place. And if we look at it as a, life, as a, as a, as a uh, living space, it represents over 99% of our living space. I always have these interesting debates with educators because we all grew up thinking, ah, oh, yes, the ocean represents 72, 72% of our planet. But that's only on a two-dimensional space. You take the third dimension, and all of a sudden it becomes a much larger picture. And with this said, the average depth, of course, being 12,000 meters. I'm sorry, uh, 4,000 feet, 12,000 uh, 12, feet, 4,000 meters. I always prefer speaking in meters than feet, but living in the United States, they don't even understand what the metric system is. It's very confusing to me why you wouldn't take a simpler <laughs> approach to calculations, but... So be it. Um, it's, it's an amazing place. It contains over 95% of our world's biodiversity. And within this perspective, um, for me as an ocean explorer <coughs> and an aquanaut uh, it, and a filmmaker, it's uh, an endless curiosity. We've explored less than 5% of our oceans to date. If you take and this is a probably a gross generalization be because it's taking into account the first 100 meters of diveable space. Actually, most people don't dive anywhere near 100 meters. Uh, and uh, a few of the bits and pieces that we've been able to kind of dabble in with submersibles and ROVs and a few other things. We've explored less than 5%. Yet, the perspective changes a bit when we are faced with um, our own needs, our own desires, our own consumption, uh, and a lot of the uh, unfortunate impacts from poor decisions in the past within the, the realm of um, what some people call sustainability or conservation or living in balance with the planet. Uh, it's something that um, 
a lot of uh, people in the world, well, 7.4 billion people in the world and growing every day, um, lose sight of. But when I go to places that no one has been, walking on a beach, thousand nautical miles from civilization, and I take a scoop of sand and I see plastic in the sand, it becomes a very stark reality. Uh, same thing as when we are at the bottom. I see, I see. Thank you, fantastic. Uh, we're already four slides ahead. Um, but we'll catch up in a second. Uh, you know, I go down to the bottom of the sea. Let's take shipwrecks, for example. I was talking about the submarine that I was in that uh, unfortunately almost became a shipwreck. Uh, and we have over three million estimated shipwrecks at the bottom of the sea. Some call it archeology, span some call it junk, some call it artificial reefs, whatever it be. The uh, perspective there is that uh, a lot of the deeper places that we go to now, that we have yet to explore, we're starting to see uh, our refuse. And that's a little bit alarming to me. Now why am I talking about garbage when we're talking about sustainable energy or renewable energies? Because they're very much linked. To go a little bit back since we're, we're back uh, up and running, um, you know, something that I grew up with and that really shaped my life is something that my grandfather said, which is when one person, for whatever reason, has a chance to live an extraordinary life, he or she has no right to keep it to themselves. I believe that each and every one of us has that opportunity because we all lead extraordinary lives. We're people and myself and, and others within this circle uh, have the privilege and honor of being leaders in the future. Uh, I'm just a storyteller, but you all are uh, an integral part of the decision-making process that will make us viable in the future or not. And at the end of the day, it's not about environmental conservation. It's a trivial aspect of the conversation. It's about our future. It's about our viability on this planet. Because we're facing uh, a very real, stark uh, reality, which is that we are the decision makers of our fate, which is the first time ever in this planet's history that any species has had that opportunity. We're also the one species that is responsible for the mass extinction of this planet. There are now, this counting this extinction, uh, six mass extinctions. First time ever in this planet's history that one species has been responsible for that. But we can, I, I'm not a, a pessimist. I'm actually a, a, if you want to call it a, a hopeful realist. <laughs> We have the opportunity, and I've seen a lot of change in the recent past that gives uh, realistic hope that we can change the course for the better not only of society and the cultures and all that, but also for economics and long-term uh, brighter future for many reasons. Now, a little bit to, uh, I might have to raise this up a little bit, to go back in, in history, some of you may recognize this gentleman, uh, Jacques Cousteau, my grandfather. He was, amongst other things, an inventor. Not because he wanted to be an inventor, but he had to be. You know, as a pioneer, most of the tools that he needed to go and explore the ocean world were not existing. Uh, he created the Aqualung, for example, with an engineer by, uh, who, with Ernie Kid called Emile Gagnon. And Gagnon was also uh, integral in some of the OTEC developments in the 30s and 40s and into the uh, 50s, I believe. But the reason why he was even connected with Air Liquide in the first place was because of this lady who was uh, petting this lovely dog who was her, her pet, Scott. This is uh, Simone Cousteau, my grandmother. And she was really the catalyst for a lot of his success, including the fact that his, uh, her father was on the board uh, and working with Air Liquide in the CAD, uh, one of the executives. And the connection was made right then and there with OTEC technology. And, the, and this was a very interesting thing for my grandparents because uh, being forward thinkers and having explored the oceans for many decades, they were 
going from a pure exploration sense to uh, exploration with a message of conservation. Of course, you all know this uh, uh, series, uh, the Ocean and the Sea World and Jacques Cousteau. Uh, some of them highlighted some of these inventions. One of my favorites, of course, was the, uh, uh, the world without sun. Not the silent world, which is very well known, but the world without sun, uh, where uh, my grandfather's uh, divers lived underwater for 30 days to explore this final frontier on our planet. And I always found this fascinating. An underwater city, like a le real live uh, Atlantis, how does that function? You know, technology back then was not quite what it is today. More on this in a second. And so this is how I was polluted, with this crazy, these crazy notions, these uh, uh, Jules Verne type of, uh, uh, of out-of-the-box thinking that uh, a lot of my peers thought I was a crazy little boy, you know, crazy friend sometimes. Uh, I've been diving since my fourth birthday, scuba diving. I've been uh, going on expeditions since I was seven. And it's, uh, and I say this a little bit embarrassingly so, uh, thanks to this or because of this, that I was a terrible student in school. I'm a big proponent of education. I loved my professors. I couldn't stand being uh, enclosed in a box, in a cement box, in a cement box, in a cement jungle. Because I would always be looking out the window at the birds chirping in the, in the, in the trees and all that. And I, instead of this two-dimensional black and white chalkboard and uh, someone barking things at me, I was, I was terrible, terrible, terrible student. Because I was polluted, I was always going out on expeditions and looking at the world maybe from the bottom up. Um, experiential learning is, is something that, uh, maybe not for this group, but... Uh, something that I, I definitely talk about a lot with the younger folks, uh, in addition to uh, education in classrooms, uh, because it's important, especially in today's generation with uh, the advent of these things that we're all chained to. And I keep emphasizing to people, I bought this for my convenience, not all of yours. <laughs> so, you know, with this generation and my four and a half year old starting to be able to manipulate these things better than, you, than I can, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting world that we are, we are living in and one that we need to connect with so that the general population, not those in the, in the know, but the, those who need to know, understand how important technologies like OTEC for the future viability of our planet uh, is. And that's really what it is. For me, my mission is the human ocean connection. Uh, I use uh, the platforms that uh, created uh, uh, not only a uh, film corporation but also uh, a nonprofit to try and connect human beings with the importance of the ocean or water part of our planet. Now, this has been talked about yesterday, and for those of you who, who weren't there, um, Jules Verne was a big uh, influencer in my life. As a little kid, this was a, one of my favorite stories, the uh, 20 Milieux sur les, uh, sur les Mers. Um, he was also, I guess, credited with uh, the original idea back in the 1800s, 1880s, uh, 1870, I'm sorry, uh, with uh, the, the, the idea of OTEC, the idea of cold and hot water ex uh, exchange for electricity, for energy generation. Later on, as we mentioned, um, you know, Jacques Arsène, uh, uh, I can never say this, his last name, uh, Darsonval, uh, was certainly uh, the true inventor of more modern day OTEC rather than just the concept. Uh, and along with uh, a gentleman who's infamous, uh, unfortunately, by the name of Georges uh, Claude, who started the experiments in house uh, and eventually went to uh, Cuba for the first, uh, I guess, the on first or onshore plant, 22 uh, kilowatts. Didn't last very long, from what I understand, it was only, what, 15 days, is that right? Something like this before a hurricane destroyed it. And that's the end of the history lesson as far as that's concerned. You all are much better experts at this than I could ever be. But it does lead me to uh, what I had mentioned earlier, which is the connection with the family. 
Uh, in the 30s and 40s, the uh, Ernie Keen connection was made with my grandfather. And he was hooked. Uh, you know, he was always a, a big uh, uh, protester. Uh, as a matter of fact, he would lay down on the train tracks in France in the 30s. Uh, 40s and 50s uh, with his uh, followers and following to stop the dumping of nuclear waste uh, to protest uh, nuclear power because he knew that it, in the, its current form it was a very dirty way to create energy. Um, he knew that black fuels were also not a long-term option. Uh, as much as we're all hooked on them and we're dependent on, on these things, we needed to go beyond the traditional uh, technologies and look into the future. Very forward thinking for those days. As a matter of fact, thanks to uh, Diego, um, I was given this book called Pensée en Agolé Ta Mère by Cousteau and Jacquier. Uh, <laughs> chapter 9, as a matter of fact, starts with Énergie des Mères. Abondante, renouvelable, gratuite, propre et pourtant délaissée. Or délaissée, pardon. Which means uh, abundant, renewable, Free, well, that's debatable depending on your perspective, <laughs> and uh, abandoned or, or ne uh, uh, neglected. Le potentiel d'énergie de la mer est phén phénoménal. Elle reçoit chaque année du soleil près de 45 000 fois l'équivalent des calories de consommation électrique mondiale. Now, remind, uh, remember, this was written in 1981, uh, published by Robert Laffont. But basically, he's saying that uh, the ocean receives about 45,000 times the calorie equivalent from the sun of the consumption of, elect of electricity worldwide. La température des eaux, he talks later on about the, the temperature variations and that more than 1,000 meters, you know, the temperature variations and how we can uh, generate energy from this. And it goes on and on. So even as late as the 80s, and as a matter of fact, even into uh, uh, Rio, the original Rio, and beyond, he was talking about the rights of future generations as it pertained to uh, energies. We have a big challenge, as I mentioned earlier. I won't delve on this too much. I want to thank uh, Blue Eyes for letting me pilfer a couple of your slides. Um, but essentially, as I mentioned earlier, it's a closed loop system. Uh, food, energy, water, all life-giving uh, resources that uh, we have in limited, in limited state uh, are hugely wasted, as you know. Uh, and we're also facing, of course, overpopulation. How do we make things more efficient? Well, part of that solution, as Diego had mentioned earlier, is a renewable energy. And presumably, OTEC is one of the fort runners as far as uh, energy generation. So how do people protect what they don't understand? For me, um, you know, I, I, I see myself as trying to do that connection through uh, empowering education. Uh, sometimes it's audiovisuals, uh, sometimes it's a symposium, sometimes it's uh, uh, going out and doing restoration projects with communities uh, to connect them better with the understanding that uh, each and every one of us are part of the solution. For me, of course, that selfish part of it is adventure and exploration. Now, uh, as you might uh, guess, uh, Frenchmen are a little bit crazy. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Julien was certainly no exception and, and others. Uh, but, you know, to be living underwater for 30 days, this is the habitat that I was mentioning earlier, Conchart 2. Uh, they were uh, smoking and drinking at uh, two and a half atmospheres. Now, if you think about this for a second, you have two and a, two and a half atmospheres of oxygen as well as the nitrogen, and you're smoking, open flame, not a very smart idea. Uh, alcohol, on the other hand, you can drink twice as much. <laughs> I'm saying this anecdotally, but you can imagine. So if, if any of you are divers, you know, you know what I mean. Ivresse des mers. And this was always a fascinating thing to me. Why are we always talking about space exploration without talking about ocean exploration? At the end of the day, they're very, very similar. And a lot of the space exploration, the innovations that are now adopted by space exploration, including the, the space station and the, uh, the, the uh, probes to Mars and Europa and so on and so forth, and of course all the dreams by Elon Musk and NASA and you know, the European Space Administration and so on, 
about colonizing other planets uh, comes from ocean exploration. As a matter of fact, this picture, this leviathan chained to the bottom, looks like a spider, is the last remaining habitat for scientific research and education uh, on this planet. It's called Aquarius. It's a dinosaur. It's 24 years old. It's been underwater for, tw for more than that. Uh, it's, uh, actually, I'm sorry. It's, it's been 24 years in this space. It's been underwater uh, for more than that. It's uh, also the only, uh, only platform, a very unique platform. And I decided to do something really stupid. Um, and that's to do one day longer than my grandfather did to mark a symbolic next step in ocean exploration by living at this habitat and doing uh, scientific experiments through uh, a program or a project called Mission 31. Six of us went down to this uh, Leviathan, this ha house underwater, if you will, uh, to live 31 days and do three years worth of scientific experiments on climate change, on uh, energy generation, on overconsumption of natural resources, and so on and so forth. The idea is not to be in the habitat, though. Now, why habitat? Well, habitat in, in the ocean gives you uh, the opposite of what a submarine does. Submarine segregates you from the environment. It allows you to go certain places that you can't from a habitat or from scuba diving. But it doesn't allow you to be immersed in the environment to really experience and to collect data in a way that one can only do in person. <laughs> so although it's nice to take pictures through the uh, for viewport, and sometimes you get visitors like this looking in while you're having dinner. It's a bit like a little, a uh, little bit like a reverse fishbowl. Uh, the idea is really to be out there and looking at what is happening. I, I took this picture originally to to because it was a curiosity. Here we are doing scientific experiments on the on the reef, and actually deeper than the reef. Uh, and these animals called spotted eagle rays were coming by. Oh wow! Picture up. You know, occasionally, you know, after a while, we started, they started getting, we started getting bored of watching them. We started doing our experiments, and they would come by and slap us with their fins, with their, with their wings. And I realized, you know, these pelagics, they don't stick around normally. They come and go and come and go, and, you know, they, 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 they travel. But these animals, seven of them, stuck around for the 31 days. And it was a, to me, it was an example of the influence that we have on oceans. This was a benign example, and one that was very endearing to us because we had our, our guardian angels, so to speak, with us for those 31 days. But the human, you know, human beings influence the ocean no matter what we do. And with this in mind, we need to understand that as amazing as technology is in the right circumstances, we have to do our checks and balances when we install something, uh, even renewables. So I, I urge, you know, we had a conversation last night, I think, at dinner. Someone was, I was trying to emphasize CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. And just because we're in the renewable space doesn't mean that a CSR program shouldn't be an integral part of the development of sustainable energies. Beyond this, of course, the, uh, the, we looked at uh, at the Human Ocean Connection, uh, it was a wonderful time to talk about uh, our, our influence on uh, the world. Um, we looked at new technologies. Now, I'm unfor unfortunately, unfortunately, thanks to my grandfather, I was one of the early adopters of a home computer, TRS-80 Model 3, back in 1982. I'm aging myself, but I was a, a barely a teenager, and I've been hooked on these things ever since. You know. Tweet. I, even I, <laughs> embarrassing. I still play games. Um, I call it science. I say I call it research. <laughs> but when we were able to go down and look at the pulse amplitude modulated fluorometer and adapt it to look at uh, coral reef health and how that's uh, uh, involved in uh, uh, the degradation of the polyps because of pollution related issues of acidification related issues and so on and so forth it really gets me going. Uh, not so much because of the bad news, but because we're learning more about how the ocean ticks. Of course, we have uh, what I call the sponge uh, anal probe. <laughs> uh, my scientists are not very happy with me when I say this. But we're able to collect uh, over 100 data uh, points uh, of, for various reasons, including 
cold water upwelling onto the reef. Now, okay, cold water upwelling onto the reef is something that happens in many places naturally, but it's becoming more and more erratic due to climate change related effects. And why does that matter? Well, because when cold water comes up and upwells and fills these barrel sponges and everything else, it shuts down the metabolism of the reef. And as it shuts down the metabolism of the reef, it affects the reef in very fundamental ways. So even though it may be not be uh, specifically pertinent to this industry per se, it influences tourism, it influences hospitality, it influences uh, our food systems, it influences a lot of things that we need to be aware of. And as far as the OTEC industry, we need to also be able to go back to that CSR part of, of my uh, uh, mention, is that when we have the effort from these programs, from these uh, projects, we need to make sure that we don't create algal blooms or other problems within that, that close proximity to our, our ecosystem near shore. It was a total experiment. I didn't know what was going to happen with our aquanauts. Uh, we were six of us in a 60 meter cube uh, space, so you can imagine, nice and cozy. <laughs> we were diving 12 hours a day. Uh, psychologically, I wasn't sure what was going to happen to us. Physiologically, I wasn't quite sure, although there were some experiments before us, thankfully, so uh, we had some indication, but uh, our hair grew twice as fast. We lost our sense of taste. Thank God we lost our sense of taste, because as a French person, I do enjoy food, and we were eating astronaut food the entire time. Uh, Remember the smoking? We had no open flame in, in our habitat, so we couldn't cook anything. We could only heat things with hot water. So you can imagine the freeze-dried food that you do for camping. <laughs> Terrible. We had to put hot sauce on it just to actually taste it because our sense of taste was gone. But I digress. We were able to, uh, because it was so unique, and because we had, for the first time ever in a Cousteau expedition, Wi-Fi at the bottom of the sea, we were able to talk to over 80,000 students worldwide in seven continents. Yes, Antarctica as well. Uh, we had participants from that. And uh, had 9,400 articles written over the 31 days. And that was really, to me, the most important part is because of that human ocean connection. We did three years of science, as I mentioned. We had uh, 12, 13 papers out through um, Northeastern University, uh, MIT, uh, FIU and a, and a few others. But the idea to me was really to get people to understand why it's so important to protect our oceans. And unfortunately, those divers uh, in the audience might understand, uh, we had to go back to the surface. And that required desaturating, which took over 24 hours on and off oxygen. Now the reason why I say uh, space exploration and ocean exploration are very similar is because we were faced with very similar parameters. As saturation divers, as aquanauts, as opposed to astronauts, um, once you're on an aquanaut, you, you know, you're saturated, you live underwater for a certain amount of time, uh, you, are the, you are experiencing very similar uh, effects, very similar things as one does when one wants to colonize the, the, the space part of our, of our uh, universe. Um, we are not allowed to go back up to the surface. We have to desaturate first, despite the once you're in outer space, you're a little bit segregated as well, especially if you're going to Mars. At least we get to come back. <laughs> but as far as energies are concerned, we were looking, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a little bit on uh, alternative energies, because one of the things I did not like about this platform was it was using an umbilical to the surface with a buoy and fossil fuels to generate energy and to power the pumps for uh, our oxygen, for our air supply even though we had battery banks and we had air at the bottom in up to three days, uh, for the long term, we needed uh, that umbilical to the surface. What would it be like to get rid of it and to be able to live completely segregated from that surface environment? Before I get to that, I'd like to share with you a one minute video uh, just to uh, illustrate a little bit more better than I can uh, about the experience. I want you to meet Captain Jacques-Yves Cousteau, <coughs> the world's foremost underwater explorer. Once upon a time, my grandfather believed that man could live and work beneath the waves. We began to look at the ocean differently. He inspired me and generations to explore the human ocean connection. 
It was a whole world, a world without sun. And in 1964, he lived and worked for 30 days on the ocean floor. But then something happened. We lost our way. Countless frontiers unexplored. Oceans that need our help more than ever. It's time for a reboot to respark the human ocean connection. My name is Fabian Cousteau. Join me and my crew on a journey to Aquarius, the last undersea habitat, and prove that there is a future for us beneath the waves. Yeah, coming soon. <laughs> Sorry, that was just a, a little teaser for the documentary itself. Um, so, future of ocean exploration. Some pretty bright stuff happening. Integrating some of the, the latest technologies, I think that we can definitely go to this final frontier and maybe even imagine an underwater city like a real life Atlantis, uh, like this. You know, I, it's funny, I, I look at this picture, I've used this picture a while now, and I just recently, since, uh, since we've been uh, talking uh, with Blue Rise, that this uh, illustration uh, has a power station, and that power station looks strangely like a pos possibly even an OTEC power station. Uh, from the, the tube that goes to the surface or, or in a column and everything else. And that, I think, could be a very interesting solution to uh, having that umbilical cut from the surface. Now, is the future of ocean exploration like this uh, in the future? I think we could do it. I think technologically it's absolutely possible already today, using new materials, using new technologies, growing our own food, uh, ha having our own energy source, uh, at least for the midterm, uh, long term, I don't know if anyone would or can live underwater for more than several months, but uh, it's certainly an experiment I'm willing to, to uh, try. And more importantly, it gives us that unprecedented access to the 95% of our planet that we haven't explored yet. And I think it's very important. Because as we delve in new technologies, as we delve in, in technologies that are ripe to be implemented worldwide, that are, uh, I feel, on the cusp of doing so with OTEC, we can look at addressing some very fundamental issues. We need to live in this uh, world as a balance, checks and balances, right? We, we live, we breathe, therefore we have an impact. And even uh, renewables have an impact. More importantly, the way we're living now has a very, very, very negative impact, as most of you know. Uh, we can't replicate this planet. We certainly are not all moving to another planet anytime in the near future or within the next few hundred years even. So why not take care of our life support system uh, for many good reasons, uh, including if it's just selfishly for economics, there's a lot of opportunity with innovation. Because at the end of the day, we're facing some very monumental challenges beyond energy uh, issues. Where we're, you know, as an ocean planet, we've pilfered, if you will, consumed over 50%, almost 60% of our world's total fish stocks, wild fish stocks. Yes, there's farming. Uh, it's uh, in many cases has a mixed reviews because it's not done necessarily very well in that industry, and in some cases it is. Uh, there's a, a resistance from the general public uh, in some cases as well. So there's challenges. 
Um, in terms of pollution, we don't, I, I pick on plastics, I shouldn't just pick on plastics because there are solutions, but we dump over one million metric tons of plastic in our ocean every hour worldwide. It's a huge problem. And of course, places, things like Fukushima, the Gulf oil spill, the sixth ex extinction, all those things, all those things that we don't want to live with, are examples of why we need to adopt OTAC and other technologies so that we can live in a better uh, balance with this life support system. So uh, I guess in conclusion, what I'm trying to say is I, I'm a big believer in OTEC. Uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, in diversification, in um, evolution of technologies, in a, uh, adaptation of our situation uh, for the viability of our future as well as the viability of our fellow symbiont creatures on this planet. So I want to thank you all for being the, the leaders of this technology, um, of making it a uh, possibility, ad uh, adopting it or adapting it for every one of the situations uh, that uh, are present uh, for your businesses in different parts of the world. Uh, and um, I support you wholeheartedly. Um, I'll finish by saying that uh, my grandfather used to say, people protect what they love. They love what they understand, and they understand what they're taught. And I hope the story of OTEC has a long future ahead of it, and one that it will be a leader in future energy technologies. Thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't overrun my time. I'm sorry. The clock was completely off. <laughs> it's okay. No, we're, we're, we're good on time. David, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for, for sharing your story with us. But I, thank you, I think, most of all because you're, you're helping us do something that, that some of us in the technical field have a lot of trouble with. And it's connecting with all the, all the other people in the world and sharing you know, the potential of this, of this technology, your work on education, your work with kids, I understand. Uh, this afternoon, for instance, you're going to go talk to an elementary school. Yeah. I'll be talking about OTAC, <laughs> <laughs> amongst other things. Of exactly. Course. Share, sharing this message with, with a much broader audience than, than just uh, you know, the, 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 the small group of insiders that are, that are here. Also in Mission 31, when you were talking uh, with, with some, some of the Lockheed Martin people. Oh, uh, yes. Well. So uh, exactly. we were talking with Lockheed Martin, um, uh, actually about renewables and, and the future of, of oceans as, a, as an energy source. We were talking uh, uh, with decision makers as well. I, 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 I mentioned kids. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Mission 31 also uh, garnered a lot of attention by decision makers around the world, the governor of Florida, uh, some ministers in different parts of, of uh, different uh, countries around the world, uh, the, the press, uh, we, uh, one of the um, hosts of, of you know, Weather Channel and a few others um, had said, you know, it's the first time we've seen the topic of ocean in the news for a straight 31 days since the advent of your grandfather. And, uh, to me, that was the success, is to be able to keep that lens focused on the importance um, of this precious resource that gives us everything that we depend on. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, since you're here, yeah, and, yeah. And we have this room full of people, uh, I, I'm going to open up with, we're, we're okay on time for, we're okay? for okay. a couple okay. of okay. questions. Uh, that was I was flying blind there, as you probably have. So. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has some questions, yes? Sure. Um, uh, thanks for the great presentation. It was very interesting. And um, aside from the whole uh, presentation, I was actually also quite interested at the uh, the beginning, uh, you you mentioned uh, the submarine. Ah yes. Uh, yes. What, what what happened? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't finish so, that story, did so I? So like usually <laughs> when you tell such a story, <laughs> like we know you're still alive. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know when I saw the picture, I was like squirrel. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so uh, luckily, you know, it's just like diving. Uh, we used to say a, a, a diver diving alone dives in bad company. Uh, it's the same thing with submarines. And unfortunately, you know, submarines cost a lot of money. Sub, uh, I call them, we have to call them submersibles because it's different from submarines. Submersibles are specific to scientific research. And they're smaller and, and they have different capabilities. 
but the submersible, um, this was up in the, in the Mediterranean, um, had, uh, it was a shakedown crew, so we knew some problems were going to happen. I, we didn't realize everything that could, the, the light leak uh, warning, I forgot to mention this, there's a, you know, there's a, war there's a light that le blinks for uh, warnings, uh, for leaks. That started going off too. And luckily that was just a, uh, a glitch in the, in the system and not a real leak. Um, but um, what happened was that we had a sister submarine. Uh, you know, Jules and Jim were two separate submarines. They're beautiful submarines, they're, they're a little sphere. You can sit two people and so you can have almost a 340 degree view. And they saw, you know, we couldn't communicate with them anymore and so, and they saw our lights go out both the in interior as well as the exterior lights. So the, the emergency lights went on, the red ones. Um, and so they came and, and uh, helped us until we could, uh, well, they, they stayed stand by. And, you know, eventually what we would have to do is blow, either blow the ballast uh, or drop the weight, uh, which you really don't want to do because you know, it's an expensive piece of kit, you know, that much lead, but the emergency. Uh, luckily, we were able to finagle and we saw that there was a short because of the humidity, you know, I mentioned the humidity. So it was raining like a tropical rainforest inside from our perspiration because the air conditioning went out. Uh, and it had short-circuited uh, some of the uh, electronics behind us. So we were able to uh, jury-rig uh, the, the, the panel to get the life support back on, get the, uh, the, the, the general power back on. We did get everything up and running but we had communications with the other sub and, and we floated to the surface and they came to get us to the Zodiac and to tow us back to the boat. So we obviously survived. Um, but uh, you know, it's always an adventure. Um, it reminds me of what I said about space. You know, luckily for us, we could float to the surface. You know, in space, when you have that kind of emergency, you're out of luck. <laughs> you, have to, you have to figure things out by yourself. And that's why I love the connection with space exploration. NASA, for example, sends their uh, uh, virgin uh, astronauts to that habitat, even though it's old. It gives them a sense of what they're going to face in the space station and beyond. So, um, you know, uh, I'm selfishly saying this for scientific research and for documentary filmmaking, but an underwater village or town could also be very interesting for alternative uh, technologies. Uh, energy generation, et cetera, et cetera, in extreme environments. And if it works under there, why wouldn't it work at the surface uh, or in space? So, very exciting. Thanks a lot. Another question back there? Uh, good morning. Thank you for the speech again. My name is Pierre from uh, Bardo. So, my question is. Um, Today we are discussing about OTEC and creating energy from the ocean. So basically we will go offshore, we will go to the sea, to a place who for me belongs to wildlife and so on. Yeah. So my question is, what is your vision of what we will do offshore? What do you think we should avoid or do? Or uh, this is a very good question. Um, slightly off topic, but it, it is related. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday, I think, also. Um, at dinner, actually, I think it was, and we were talking about the, you know, where do you install uh, uh, energy or OTEC plants in the space, whether it's onshore, offshore, uh, and other technologies as well, and, and what, how, you know, how do you uh, recoup resources from uh, this environment without destroying it? Uh, I'm thinking, for example, uh, a few months ago, two months ago, I went on another submarine. <laughs> I obviously didn't learn my lesson. Uh, and uh, we were looking at deep water sponges for, uh, for cures for malaria, for the, the, so the chemical properties. Uh, and they've actually found some elements within the chemical properties. So they, they're now working, the biochem company that I brought with me is now working with Scripps Institute to, uh, in their trials right now, they have a, a solution for curing malaria, uh, cancer as well. So there's very, a lot of valuable things in there that a lot of people want. You know, minerals, of course, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The most uh, straightforward solution, and uh, thanks to uh, COP, and thanks to uh, a lot of leaders around the world, we're now starting to see forward momentum in protecting parts of the ocean. Uh, MPAs, 
marine protected areas are paramount. And I'd be, by that I mean sanctuaries, not partially protected, but fully protected. You know, in uh, the United States, for example, they have, I think, 12 or 13 percent of their land being national parks. Why is it that we only have 1 percent in the ocean? And we're almost at 2 percent now, thankfully, because of recent events. Uh, France has woken up a little bit. Thank, I, I feel proud because I talked to, uh, I, this is not a political discussion, but I talked to Sigrid Hanna Koyal, the minister, and they, you know, she was very proud of what they were doing uh, for uh, protecting uh, ocean uh, as far as French territory. And I think a lot of countries could stand to benefit from doing this. Um, the ocean belongs to nobody and everybody at the same time. So it's a very difficult conversation to have with laws of the sea and so on and so forth. But we're starting to see that there's forward momentum in protecting large swaths of ocean. Uh, I think scientists, and, and I agree, say 30% would be ideal. Uh, but even if we get to half that uh, within, uh, uh, from now until 20, uh, well, they, their aim is, the UN's aim is 2020, but 2030, uh, I think we have a, a much better chance at protecting that biodiversity, especially if these MPAs, these marine protected areas are chosen accordingly to the, uh, the high sensitivity and high density of wildlife. Uh, so it's, uh, it's something I'm very much interested in and, and uh, uh, working with uh, other organizations to help that process along. But decision makers, and more importantly the public, as well as businesses, have to be a, an integral part of that decision making process. Um, you know, when we talk about, I was talking about CSR, maybe one of the elements of, uh, of OTAC plants is to have their uh, area protected not only for security, but also as a, as a protected area, marine protected area for wildlife. Uh, it's a fairly low impact from what I can tell, a very low impact um, system if done properly. Uh, so why not create the area around it, whether it's on land and the sea, uh, being some of those marine parks. Maybe even expand them a little bit with the help of the local government. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. We, we heard a bit of that into, into the plants that are going on in Martinique and the protection around it, mainly for security reasons, that's but right. it has, a, it, it has a, a much bigger purpose. In it. Well, and, and it's a benefit, you know, this is a natural resource bank account. We need to live off the interest rather than eating away the capital. If you look at places that have been protected, you know, look at the New, New Zealand, uh, the Four Nights National Marine Sanctuary, or uh, Cape Canaveral in, in the United States. Those have protected zones. Now, in, in New Zealand, that marine park uh, was protested by the fishermen, the local fishermen. Ah, oh, you're stealing our livelihood. No, no, no. And, you know, it went through, and two, two years later, they were catching twice as many fish as they were previously. They're now the biggest protectors and, and uh, uh, proponents of expanding that marine sanctuary because they see that it's their bank account. So it's not about uh, saying no to doing business. It's about doing business properly and benefiting from that interest that it generates. Very good. Well, thank you, Fabian. Thank you very much. <laughs>